We live in interesting times for the headlines. President Donald Trump insists that the United States could avoid a major coronavirus outbreak even as infections ricochet around the world. Now is the time to prepare for a potential pandemic. That's the stark warning from the World Health Organization as borders close, state emergencies are declared, and cities go on lockdown. A gunman kills five co-workers at one of America's best-known breweries before turning the weapon on himself in the latest burst of mass gun violence in the United States. I'm Alma Angeles, wherever you're watching from around the world. Thank you very much for joining us and out to the news. President Donald Trump has played down fears of a major coronavirus outbreak in the U.S. Even as infections ricochet around the world and express confidence, his administration is ready to respond. He has also appointed Vice President Mike Pence to lead the U.S. response to the novel coronavirus. Let's listen in. We do have uh, plans of a much, uh, on a much larger scale, should we need that. Uh, we're working with states. We're working with virtually every state. Uh, and we do have plans on a larger scale if we need it. We don't think we're going to need it, but, you know, you always have to be prepared. Trust your instincts. I don't think I have. They've said it could be worse, and I've said it could be worse, too. I also think, no, I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it's inevitable. Uh, I think that we're doing a really good job in terms of maintaining borders, in terms of letting people in, in terms of checking people. But we're very, very ready for this, countries in the world, by Johns Hopkins. And what I've done is I'm going to be announcing uh, exactly right now that I'm going to be putting our Vice President, Mike Pence, in charge. Approach. Um, as a uh, former governor uh, from the state where the first MERS case uh, emerged in 2014, uh, I know full well uh, the importance of presidential leadership, the importance of administration leadership, and the vital role of partnerships of state and local governments and health authorities in responding to the potential threat of dangerous infectious diseases. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I look forward, uh, Mr. President, to uh, serving uh, in this role and bringing together uh, all the members of the Corona Task Force that you've established, HHS, CDC, DHS, the Department of Transportation, and State. But a short while after an upbeat press conference by the U.S. President, health authorities said they had detected the first case of unknown origin in the country, signaling that the virus may be spreading within communities. The CDC said the latest case in California did not have relevant travel history or exposure to another known patient, meaning it could represent the first instance of community spread in the U.S., Though this has not yet been confirmed, community spread means spread of an illness for which the source of the infection is unknown. Dr. Anne Shushet, the principal deputy director of the CDC, said that the agency expects more cases and that it is a good time for the American public to prepare. Dr. Anthony Fauci, meanwhile, who leads the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, said that while work to develop a vaccine for the coronavirus is ongoing, the process of testing to make sure it works and is safe will take months to a year to complete. Again, let's listen in. Our aggressive containment strategy here in the United States has been working and is responsible for the low levels of cases that we have so far. However, we do expect more cases, um, and this is a good time to prepare. Um, we, as you heard, it's the perfect time for businesses, healthcare systems, universities, and schools to look at their pandemic preparedness plans, dust them off, and make sure that they're ready and we have lots more information at the CDC's website and in partnership on how to do that. But it's also a really good time for the American public to prepare and for you to know what this means for you. The 
coronavirus that we're talking about is a respiratory virus. It's spread in a similar way to the common cold or to influenza. It's spread through coughs and sneezes. And so those everyday sensible measures that we tell people to do every year with the flu um, are important here. Covering your cough, staying home when you're sick, and washing your hands. T tried and true, not very exciting measures, but really important ways that you can prevent the spread of respiratory viruses. Just a very quick update on the countermeasure development in the form of vaccines and therapeutics. I had told this audience at a, a recent uh, press briefing that we have a number of vaccine candidates and one prototype one to give you a, a, a feel for the time frame of a vaccine and what its impact might be now and in subsequent years is that I told you we would have a vaccine that we would be putting into trials to see if it's safe and if it induces a response that you would predict would be protective in about three months. I think it's going to be a little bit less than that. It's probably going to be closer to two months. That would then take about three months to determine if it's safe and immunogenic, which gives us six months. Then you graduate from a trial, which is phase one of 45 people, to a trial that involves hundreds, if not low thousands of people, to determine efficacy. At the earliest, an efficacy trial would take an additional six to eight months. So although this is the fastest we have ever gone from a sequence of a virus to a trial, it still would not be any applicable to the epidemic unless we really wait about a year to a year and a half. Now, that means two things. One, the answer to containing is public health measures. We can't rely on a vaccine over the next several months to a year. However, if this virus, which we have every reason to believe it is quite conceivable that it will happen, will go beyond just a season and come back and recycle next year. If that's the case, we hope to have a vaccine. And then finally and briefly, therapeutics. There are a number of antiviral drugs that are being tested. A few days ago, we initiated a randomized controlled trial of a drug called remdesivir, which has antiviral activity in vitro in an animal model. The good news about that is that it's a trial that's randomized to either placebo or standard of care and drug and standard of care, which means that we will know reasonably soon whether it works. And if it does, we will then have an effective therapy to distribute. For a change, uh, but we are uh, totally ready, willing, and able. It's a term that we use. It's ready, willing, and able. We have, we have, uh, it's going to be very well under control. Now, it may get bigger, it may get a little bigger, it may not get bigger at all. We'll see what happens. But regardless of what happens, we're totally prepared. We're looking at worst case scenario. We're going to be set very quickly. But we, I don't think we're going to ever be anywhere near that. I really don't believe that we're going to be anywhere near that. Our borders are very controlled. Our flights in from certain areas that we're talking about are very controlled. I don't think we'll ever be anywhere near that. A stark warning from the World Health Organization. Officials say now is the time to prepare for a potential pandemic. The novel coronavirus is now in at least 45 countries with many implementing emergency plans and travel restrictions on the worst affected places. Now, the World Health Organization reported that the number of new cases reported outside China exceeded the number of new cases in China for the first time. Take a look. The pandemics of influenza can be sometimes called a lot earlier because we know we've had previous pandemics and we know with influenza that when there's highly efficient community trans transmission, as we see with seasonal flu, that the disease does spread around the world and it has proven that time and time again. So it's much easier to say a pandemic will occur in an influenza situation. Every country must make its own risk assessment for its own context. WHO is also continuing to do its own risk assessment and is monitoring the evolution of the epidemic around the clock. This is about good risk management. Now is the time to prepare. So we're in a phase of preparedness for a potential pandemic. 
That doesn't stop anyone doing what they need to do. We've had enough countries now import disease. It is time to prepare. It is time to do everything you would do in preparing for a pandemic. Pandemics of influenza can be sometimes called a lot earlier because we know we've had previous pandemics and we know with influenza that when there's highly efficient community trans transmission, as we see with seasonal flu, that the disease does spread around the world and it has proven that time and time again. So it's much easier to say a pandemic will occur in an influenza situation. Every country must make its own risk assessment for its own context. WHO is also continuing to do its own risk assessment and is monitoring the evolution of the epidemic around the clock. This is about good risk management, it's about good communication between states, it's about management and early detection of cases and their appropriate isolation and treatment. Uh, it's not about shutting borders, it's about uh, coherent, coordinated public health action by a number of member states who share borders in order to effectively manage the public health consequences of, of any importation of uh, COVID-19. More than 82,100 infections and 2,800 deaths worldwide, according to the latest toll from the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. The numbers of deaths in China, where the virus was first detected, has declined with 29 more deaths reported on Thursday, the lowest daily figure in almost a month. But the daily number of infections worldwide is higher than in China. More than 50 deaths have been reported outside mainland China since the start of the epidemic. Out of more than 3,600 people infected, according to the Johns Hopkins Center, cases of the virus have appeared in nine new countries, Romania, Algeria, Austria, Croatia, Georgia, Greece, Norway, Pakistan, and Switzerland, bringing the number of countries hit to more than 45. South Korea has announced more than 1,500 more than 1,590 infections, by far the largest outside China, and 12 deaths. Also, 20 members of South Korea's military have been infected, as well as a U.S. military service member stationed there, along with more than 1,200 civilians. The U.S. and South Korea's militaries postponed forthcoming joint exercises due to the outbreak. The number of infections in Italy, the hardest-hit country in Europe, hits the 400 mark late on Wednesday with 12 deaths. Iran announced a total of 26 deaths, including the country's deputy health minister. And new COVID-19 cases across Europe emerged. Germany's health minister said the country is facing a coronavirus epidemic as new cases are reported across Europe. Now, so far, there are 21 reported cases in four states with 13 patients cured and no one has died. 14 of the cases were in Bavaria and were among the first anywhere outside China. Related to the auto parts supplier Webasto and a visiting Chinese colleague, Estonia also reported its first coronavirus case on Thursday, a day after after the man returned to the Baltic nation of just 1.3 million people from his homeland, Iran. The Iranian citizen is currently hospitalized. Denmark reported also its first coronavirus case Thursday. A man who had returned from a skiing holiday in northern Italy, which has become a hot spot for the disease. Cases of the virus have appeared in Romania, Austria, Croatia, Georgia, Greece, Norway, and Switzerland. In France, two people have died with more than a dozen infected after the death of a 60-year-old French person on Wednesday. In Finland, two virus infections were confirmed, a Chinese tourist in Lapland and a second case involving a Finnish national who had recently visited northern Italy. One case was detected in a Belgian national who was repatriated from Wuhan in early February. He has completed his quarantine period. In North Macedonia, one case has been detected, a woman who recently returned from Italy. With 12 deaths and 400 infections, Italy is the European country worst affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. It has also been a point of contagion with many cases in other countries involving people who returned home from traveling in infection-hit areas of northern Italy.
And the Swiss authorities confirmed three new coronavirus cases on Thursday, taking the total to four across the country. Now, at the onset, our EBC correspondent from Geneva, Christine Benedicto, was able to report on the first case. Christine? The outbreak of COVID-19 continues and has now spread to some European countries. Switzerland just reported its first case of the virus on February 25th. This is following the outbreaks identified in its main neighboring countries, Austria, France, Germany, and mainly Italy. According to the Federal Health Office, the infected person, a man in his 70s, was infected near Milan, where he attended an event on February 15th. He comes from the Swiss canton of Ticino, bordering Italy. He's been with his family since suffering the first manifestation of symptoms on February 17th. The patient is currently in a hospital for isolation, though his state of health is good. Anyone who has come in contact with him since his return from Milan will be tested and quarantined for 14 days. The risk of contagion for Switzerland as a whole remains moderate. However, due to its proximity to Italy, the probability is growing that other cases may be diagnosed. The government will continue to work in raising awareness. Testing on patients with flu-like symptoms have already stepped up. In the meantime, they highlight the importance of observing basic hygiene habits, regular washing of hands, and coughing or sneezing into a paper tissue or the crook of one's elbow. Reporting for Eagle News International from Geneva, Switzerland, I'm Christine Benedicto, 1 with 25. Thank you, Christine. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization also warned that African health systems would be ill-equipped to respond to the deadly coronavirus outbreak should cases start to proliferate on the continent. Take a look. We are facing a looming uh, threat, I mean, a serious threat for the continent, which requires both a technical and political advocacy. The vulnerable is that if truly we have uh, a virus introduced on the continent and it becomes a larger issue, the ability to procure diagnostics in a timely fashion to support that testing will still be limited. That in some member states we have weak uh, public health institutions, uh, weak systems, health systems, we have uh, gaps in the diagnostics, we have uh, gaps also uh, for um, the treatments and the measures we need to take quickly. But I think by joining our collective efforts as African member states, by the leadership of WHO and the joint effort between WHO and Africa CDC, we managed very quickly uh, to fill in the gaps of the diagnostics. Uh, capabilities in the continent. International health experts have expressed concern about Iran's handling of the coronavirus outbreak. Now, such worries were shown on Tuesday when the head of the task force combating the virus, the deputy health minister, Iraj Harirchi, admitted he himself had been infected. Take a look. Now, the deputy minister denied covering up the scale of the outbreak while he was appearing in physical discomfort as he spoke to reporters. As you can see here, the deputy minister had coughed and wiped sweat from his brow at a joint news conference Monday with government spokesman Ali Rabi, who is now awaiting the results of the coronavirus test. During the briefing, the minister denied a claim by a member of the parliament for Guam, the center of the outbreak, that the authorities were engaged in a cover-up. Now, the latest health ministry figure shows the virus has spread across the country. Iran is believed to have been the source of the first cases reported by neighboring Afghanistan, Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, and Oman, which have now imposed restrictions on travel to and from the Islamic Republic. The UAE has also reported 13 cases, including an Iranian couple. Bahrain's health ministry, meanwhile, raised its number of confirmed cases now to 17. And here's an update now. Iran has confirmed seven new deaths 
from the coronavirus over the past 24 hours, according to the health ministry, taking the overall toll to 26, the highest outside China. An additional 106 confirmed infections took the total number of cases so far to 245, ministry spokesman Kianish Jan Poor told a daily briefing. Meanwhile, a second high-profile politician announced that he had been infected with the coronavirus. The announcement by the chairman of the Iranian Parliament's National Security and Foreign Affairs Committee, Mojtaba Solnur, follows that of Deputy Health Minister Iraj Harirchi, which you saw earlier, the head of the government's coronavirus task force on Tuesday. A Shiite cleric, Zolnur is a member of parliament for the central shrine city of Qom, where Iran's first case of the coronavirus was detected on February 19. On Wednesday, Iranian authorities announced domestic travel restrictions for people with confirmed or suspected infections. And Saudi Arabia suspended visas for visits to Islam sites for the Umrah pilgrimage, an unprecedented move triggered by coronavirus fears that raises questions over the annual Hajj. The kingdom, which hosts millions of pilgrims every year in the cities of Mecca and Medina, also suspended visas for tourists from countries with reported infections as fears of the pandemic deepen. Saudi Arabia, which so far has reported no cases of the virus, but has expressed alarm over its spread in neighboring countries, said the suspensions were temporary. It provided no time frame for when they will be lifted. The move comes as Gulf countries implemented a raft of measures, including flight suspensions and school closures, to curb the spread of the disease from people returning from pilgrimages to Iran. Even as the number of fresh coronavirus cases declines at the epicenter of the disease in China, there has been a sudden increase across the Middle East. Since its outbreak, the United Arab Emirates has reported 13 coronavirus cases, Kuwait has recorded 43 Bahrain has 33, and Oman is at four cases now. Iran has emerged as a major hotspot in the region with 26 fatalities, the highest death toll outside China where COVID-19 originated. While no cases have been reported in Saudi, one citizen is reported to be infected in Kuwait along with four Saudi women in Bahrain, all of whom had returned from Iran. And the news continues. Zero on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. And we're still following the developments on the coronavirus cases. Iraq has now announced the first confirmed case of coronavirus in the capital, Baghdad, taking nationwide infections to six and raising concerns about the capacity of the dilapidated health system to respond. The government announced sweeping measures late on Wednesday to try to contain the spread of the virus, ordering the closure of schools and universities, cafes, cinemas, and other public spaces until March 7. It also banned travel to or from some of the worst affected countries, including China, Iran, Japan, South Korea, Thailand, Singapore, Italy, Kuwait, and Bahrain. Iraq had already blocked entry for foreigners traveling from neighboring Iran, the main source of coronavirus infections in the Middle East or China, where COVID-19 originated. The health ministry also said the first case in Baghdad was in a young man who had recently returned from Iran. 
and a woman in Japan who contracted a new coronavirus and was released from hospital after recovering has again tested positive, according to officials. The case is the first time a patient apparently cleared of the virus has subsequently tested positive for it, according to a local official in Osaka. The woman in her 40s was first confirmed as infected with the coronavirus on January 29. She was working as a guide on a tour bus with tourists from Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak, in January. The driver of the bus was also diagnosed with the virus. After being Discharged from hospital, she again tested positive for the virus on February 6, although she still had a cough at the time. She had no symptoms a week later, but returned to the doctor on February 21, complaining of a sore throat and chest pains. Now on Wednesday, she tested positive for the coronavirus for a second time, according to officials. At least 186 people in Japan have so far contracted the virus, with four deaths in the country linked to the outbreak. And Japan Prime Minister Shinzo Abe called on public schools to close nationwide from March 2 to prevent the spread of the new coronavirus. Prime Minister Abe said the government considers the health and safety of children above anything else. He said, quote, we request all primary, junior high and high schools across the nation to close temporarily from March 2 next week until their spring break. The spring break for public schools usually starts late March in Japan. Many public elementary schools and junior high schools in northern Hokkaido were closed on Thursday as the governor has requested the public schools to be closed for about a week. The city of Osaka also said it will close its kindergartens, elementary and junior high schools from Saturday for two weeks. Meanwhile, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics are going ahead, according to organizers, even as the government calls for major events in coming weeks to be postponed, canceled, or scaled back over the virus. Take a look. Japan is at a crossroads in preventing a major coronavirus outbreak and may need to reconsider the Olympics if domestic transmissions are not brought under control. That is according to an expert advising the government and he has also warned an infectious disease specialist, uh, Mr. Norio Omagari. Uh, he told AFP in an interview that he believes Measures being taken by the government can still prevent the virus from spreading more widely, but that the next three weeks will be critical. Take a look. That we are now on the cross road for the containment of the uh, this uh, COVID-19, or it could be uh, you know how I can say uh, 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 the endemic endemicity, or it could be outbreak of this COVID-19 within our country. You know the process for the quarantine has not been perfect. That's why we are seeing the new patient. Uh, from the people and uh, from the passengers, you know, embarked from their this cruise ship. So that is the, I think that is the true, I mean, that is the fact we are now seeing. We have to see the situation at least three weeks from now. And we can, if we can contain the secondary or tertiary transmission within the country, and uh, in other words, if to do see the decreasing number of new cases, domestic new cases in our country, I think that is a very good sign and that's a very good signal for us to decide that uh, goal for the Olympics and Paralympic case. That's on, at least we can say that we have to really think about it for the, uh, you know, I can say, for the having the Olympic game or not, you know. A 29-year-old Filipino or Filipina in Hong Kong has tested positive for the coronavirus disease, the Department of Foreign Affairs announced on Thursday. 
In a statement, the DFA said the Hong Kong Health Department has informed the Philippine Consulate General about the patient, the second confirmed case of COVID-19 in the Chinese territory. The consulate immediately called and had a brief conversation with the patient to ascertain their condition or her condition. She's in good spirits and said she no longer has fever and that she's well taken care of by a Hospital visits are not allowed given that she is in isolation, according to the DFA. It added that the patient requested some personal items from the consulate and that her identity be kept secret. According to the consulate, the first Filipino who tested positive for the COVID-19 will be released within the week, provided that her test results remain negative. And staying in Hong Kong, Marian Choi, Marian Choi, an engineer and mother of three, had been looking forward to celebrating her 10th birthday, or technically her 40th birthday, with a big party on February 29. But the Hong Kongers' plans have been thwarted by fears over the COVID-19, and her elderly parents, who live in Australia, have canceled their tickets to come and visit their daughter. Take a look. I'm Marian. I was born in 1980. I'm turning 10 this year. I was supposed to um, to spend a, to hold a big party with my friend and my parents and mum and dad, yeah, because uh, they're getting old and I really want them to come all the way from Australia to spend my special day with me. But unfortunately, due to the coronavirus, then I, it's better for them to stay in Australia instead. Australia's Prime Minister said the country considered the new coronavirus to be a pandemic. Going a step beyond the WHO has he extended a travel ban on visitors from China. Announcing a national emergency response plan to the contagion, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said he was considering additional measures for monitoring travelers arriving in the country. Addressing the public, Mr. Morrison also said there is every indication coronavirus will become a pandemic and the risk to Australia is very much upon us, unquote. The World Health Organization has stopped short of calling the virus a pandemic, even as the number of new infections outside China exceed those inside the hardest hit country. Border Force has also been asked for advice on how to step up measures at ports of entry in the country, education ministers will now look at what steps can be taken to further protect children, according to the Prime Minister. An extended travel ban will come as a blow to Australian universities, which stand to lose $2 billion in fees, as tens of thousands of Chinese students are unable to take up places down under. Australia has reported 22 infections, but none that were contracted or passed from person to person inside the country. To other news now, a gunman killed five co-workers at one of America's best-known breweries on Wednesday before turning the weapon on himself in the latest burst of mass gun violence in the United States. President Trump opened a White House news conference on the coronavirus by calling the shooting a terrible thing. Take a look. Before I begin, I'd like to extend my deepest condolences to the victims and families in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Earlier today, a wicked murderer opened fire at a Molson Coors Brewing Company plant, taking the lives of five people. A number of people were wounded, some badly wounded. Our hearts break for them and their loved ones. We send our condolences. We'll be with them. And it's a terrible thing, terrible thing. More than 1,000 employees were at the Molson Coors Brewing Complex in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when the early afternoon tragedy occurred. According to the city's police chief, Alfonso 
Morales. He also said officers found the suspect, a 51-year-old local man, dead from an apparently self-inflicted gunshot wound. Morales later said the suspect was a Molson Coors employee. Mayor Tom Barrett said five other people, all workers at the facility in the northern U.S. state's biggest city, were killed. U.S. media, including ABC News and the local Fox affiliate, reported the shooter had had been fired earlier in the day from the beer giant, which owns the Coors and Miller brands. The local CBS affiliate said the shooter appeared to have stolen the name tag of another employee and then returned to the office complex with a gun. But the New York Times quoted Representative Owen or Gwen Moore, a Democrat whose district includes Milwaukee, as saying the gunman was an employee who was in uniform. And there have been a number of mass shootings in the upper Midwest state of Wisconsin over the past 20 years. And they include the 2012 massacre of six people by a white supremacist outside a Sikh temple in Milwaukee. The gunman also wounded four others before taking his own life. Work Workplaces have been the most common sites for mass shootings over the last five decades. In India, sporadic violence hit parts of Delhi overnight as gangs roamed streets littered with the debris of days of sectarian riots that have killed 33 people, according to police. Thousands of riot police and paramilitaries patrol the affected northeast fringes of the Indian capital of 20 million people, preventing any major eruptions. However, the unrest is the latest bout of violence over Prime Minister Narendra Modi's citizenship law, which triggered months of demonstrations that turned deadly in December. Many of India's 200 million Muslims fear the citizenship law combined with a mooted citizen's register will leave them stateless or even sent to detention camps. A fire early Thursday in the eastern French city of Strasbourg has left five people dead and seven injured, according to rescue services. The fire broke out overnight in a seven-story apartment block, and firemen had to evacuate many people as thick smoke enveloped their homes, according to a statement. The dead were three men in their 30s and 40s and two women, one 25 years old, the other in her 70s, according to officials. They died on the spot, overwhelmed by smoke and the heat of the fire in the stairwell, one local official said. The fireman told us that the walls were literally melting, he added. The rescue services said the seven people hurt were in a relatively serious condition, while those evacuated from the building were initially taken to a local gym for shelter. An Australian boy with dwarfism whose distress from bullying became a viral video will now donate hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations to charity rather than a trip to Disneyland. The clip of nine-year-old Quaid and Bale showed him crying and repeatedly saying he wanted to die after being bullied at school, sparking an outpouring of support from around the world. The video was watched millions of times and prompted U.S. comedian Brad Williams to start a GoFundMe page that eventually raised almost 475,000 U.S. dollars. Although the funds were meant to send Bales and his mom to Disneyland, his aunt told Australia's NITV News that the money would be used for charities instead. His aunt said, quote, we want the money to go to community organizations that really need it. And they know what the money should be spent on. So as much as we want to go to Disneyland, I think our community would be far off, with far off benefit from that, unquote. Australian actor Hugh Jackman and NBA player Anne Scanter were among the hundreds of thousands posting support for bails. And the news continues. Zero on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Net 25 shows live and on demand anytime, anywhere, on any mobile device on OSN Play. Congratulations to EBC Films Creative Director Carlo Ortega Cuevas. 
for receiving the Film Ambassador Award for the film Guerrero from the Film Development Council of the Philippines. To God be the glory. Welcome back. Asian and European markets fell again on Thursday as coronavirus infections surged outside China with more new countries reporting cases and analysts warning of more pain ahead for investors. Investors are growing increasingly fearful about the economic impact with several big name companies including Apple, Microsoft and drinks giant Diageo expecting sales to be hit. The virus continues to spread around the world with Brazil reporting Latin America's first case and Greece, Georgia, Norway and Pakistan following suit. Around 45 countries have now been infected and the global death the global death toll now stands at about 2,800 with more than 80,000 infected. Equity markets in Europe and the U.S. ended Wednesday on a mixed note, having been hammered the previous two days, mainly supported by bargain buying. But Asia continued to fall, with Tokyo ending 2.1%, Sydney fell 0.8%, and Singapore dipped 0.3%, while Taipei, Wellington, and Jakarta were also well down. Seoul was down 1.1% after authorities in South Korea said a total of 1,595 had been diagnosed with COVID-19 in the country, the highest outside China. London opened down 1.8%, while Paris and Frankfurt each lost 2%. However, Shanghai closed up 0.1% as the virus appeared to be easing in China while there were signs people were returning to the streets in some affected areas. And Hong Kong reversed earlier losses to end up 0.3%, while bargain hunting also helped Manila and Bangkok. Still, observers warned of worse to come for markets. Markets expert Peter Cardillo expects choppy markets as investors are getting nervous amid the coronavirus outbreak. Let's listen in. Well, I think the markets are more than nervous now. I mean, we've had... Uh, uh, a fair factor in the market for some time, but I think the market is now convinced that um, um, we have to wait and see until uh, we get numbers uh, that uh, will indicate how bad the coronavirus is going to impact the global economy. Well, I think we're going to see choppy markets. I don't think that uh, we've seen the end of this de decline because um, there's been technical damage done to it. And certainly, uh, from a psychological viewpoint, uh, you know, uh, that's working on the minds of investors. The big question is, uh, even though the uh, number of victims in China has, gotten da has gone down, uh, the economic impact in, in China is probably going to be quite serious because they're just getting back to work now more and more uh, companies are beginning to warn uh, that revenues are going to be affected. So we could be up, you know, against a very serious, um, hard second, uh, first quarter um, earnings uh, season. They are trying to stimulate as much as they can. But I think that um, the damage has already been done. And now we just have, have to wait and see as how detrimental this is going to be in terms of global growth. Uh, while a trade war or some other crises um, can be uh, dealt with in the sense that, um, you know, um, things can be changed uh, rather rapidly here, it's a question of uh, finding uh, a virus to contain it. And that takes a long time. Britain could lose up to $32 billion annually in exports to the European Union if it fails to strike a trade deal with the bloc, according to UN economists. Take a look. 
Our calculations show that if you take into account both tariffs and non-tariff measures, in other words, uh, a hard Brexit, the impact for the UK will be a loss of 14% of their overall exports to the EU, which constitutes about 32 billion US in losses for the UK economy. For the EU, there will also, well, Individually, each country is about 10% fall in, in exports. However, the difference is that they are a union. And so the ability to mitigate that fall will be easier to manage as a 27-country union. So they can, you know, pretty much recalibrate among themselves um, to fill whatever the loss may be with respect to exporting to the, to the UK. Uh, clearly, I would suggest that they ensure that they um, negotiate a comprehensive non-tariff measures agreement within any um, exit negotiation. It's critical. If they don't, frankly, the tariff side is it's bad, but it's not as bad. But if we're going to talk about the non-tariff measures and the regulatory divergence issues, the impact can be extremely um, deleterious, let's put it that way. The UN or the UNCTAD study found that even a standard trade deal such as one modeled on the EU-Canada deal advocated by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson would still see Britain's exports to the EU fall by 9%. This is because standard trade deals normally concentrate more on reducing or eliminating tariffs rather than non-tariff measures and Britain has already indicated it will diverge from the EU in terms of regulation. UNTAD or UNCTAD said this divergence means British producers will or would incur costs to meet standards when selling to the EU and there would be further costs because of customs checks. While it has been several weeks since the NFL Super Bowl, it doesn't mean football is over. The XFL is a brand new league that's receiving rave reviews. Here's Michael Hudson to tell us more. How are you doing, everybody? Michael with Eagle Sports here. I'm here in Seattle, Washington at CenturyLink Field. And no, we're not here for a Seattle Seahawks game, but we're here for the home opener for the XFL between the Seattle Dragons and the Tampa Bay Vipers. Let's go check out the action. On one of the most special days in professional sports history, the football enthusiasts and the curious alike came out to witness the XFL Seattle Dragons kick off their inaugural season with a 17-9 grinded out home win against the newly anointed 0-2 Tampa Bay Vipers. Before an XFL record 29,172 people in attendance, Seattle persevered on both sides of the ball to send the Vipers home with their second loss of the season. I feel like we really performed on coming together and just not, uh, not turning aside uh, from our belief system of what, we, of what we believe in. And it was really true uh, between that uh, coming in at, at halftime and having no points and the defense really doing a great job. I mean, all day. Uh, and maybe they could have got off the field a little bit more in that last drive, but it's hard when you're trying to just make that team go a long field. What also helped bring victory to the Dragon locker room was Seahawk legend wide receiver Steve Largent, who bore the Dragon torch and ignited the special cauldron that was announced to be a Dragon's pregame ritual throughout the season. But we had some resilience there, and I think that really showed um, the fans, showed our, our even our t their teammates that they were not going to give up. Um, <clears throat> so I was really pleased that they came back out and stayed together. We did not change the game plan. We stayed with it, and we started putting points on the board. Reynolds led the Dragons' offensive charge with three receptions for 87 yards and a touchdown, while starting linebacker Steven Johnson spearheaded the defense with nine tackles. All right, former NFL quarterback Tim Tebow, trying to realize his dream of playing Major League Baseball, was named Wednesday to the Philippine team in next month's World Baseball Classic qualifying tournament. Take a look. 
The 32-year-old minor league outfielder, one step below the major leagues last year in the New York Mets organization, was born in Makati, Philippines. Grateful and excited to play for Team Philippines in the at WBC Baseball, the country... Country One was born in and somewhere that is near, dear to my heart, Thibaut tweeted after the WBC tweeted news of his spot on the Filipino roster. The Philippines will compete March 20 to 25 at the Tucson, Arizona against Britain, New Zealand, Spain, Panama and the Czech Republic for two available berths in the 2021 World Classic. Thibaut led the University of Florida to two U.S. national collegiates, collegiate titles before being taken with the 25th Overall pick in the 2010 NFL Draft by the Denver Broncos. There are a lot of things that might come to mind when you think of Belgium. And, of course, chocolate is more than likely one of them. Kate Rebibis takes us to the Belgian Chocolate Village Museum. Take a look. Belgium may be a small country, but it is well known for its various delicacies, such as waffles, fries, mussels, and of course, the famous Belgian chocolates. Join us as we visit the Belgian chocolate village in the city of Brussels. The Belgian Chocolate Village is one of the largest museums dedicated to chocolate. It is situated in the Brussels municipality of Kukelberg since the 19th century. The tour showcases its manufacturing stages, its history, and its impact on the economy and society. The Belgian Chocolate Village is one of the largest museums dedicated to chocolate. It is situated in the Brussels municipality of Kukelberg since the 19th century. The tour showcases its manufacturing stages, its history, and its impact on the economy and society. Let us backtrack on the history of the Belgian chocolates. The raw materials of chocolates, better known as cocoa, was produced in Africa, Central America, and South America, but now also in Asia. So how did chocolate become so famous in Belgium? When Belgium was ruled by the Spanish in the 17th century, explorers brought cocoa beans from South America and introduced them to the Belgian community. Yet when Belgium colonized Congo, they found a large excess of cocoa beans, thus making Belgium the number one trader in cocoa and chocolate under the ruling of King Leopold III. This delicacy used to be a sign of luxury and nobility, and was mostly used to impress visitors. In fact, former mayor of Zurich, Henry Escher, instantly fell in love with the hot chocolate he was given when he visited the Grand Place in Brussels. He took the recipe home and introduced this to his own country, thus making Switzerland Belgium's greatest competitor in the chocolate market. Even so, Belgian chocolate remains world-renowned and definitely plays a big part in the country's economy. With over 2,000 chocolatiers, do not miss out on smelling, tasting, and learning about the famous Belgian chocolates. Here in Brussels, Belgium, I am Kate Redibis, your EBC correspondent and always one with 25. Thank you, Kate. And that's the news for tonight. Join us online and here again tomorrow evening from all of us here at Eagle News. Thank you and we'll see you soon. I'm Alma Angeles, always one with 25. Good night.